My name is Nancy Knowles and I'm on the board for Art Center East and it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight to hear uh, Jennifer Perrin read from her recent poetry. Um, I just would like to give you a little bit of background on Art Center East and then on Jennifer before we have her do her reading. Um, Art Center East is a nonprofit that has been serving Union County and Eastern Oregon since 1977. And though we are currently operating under a freeze order by the state government, we offer three galleries, art classes online in person, retail and teaching opportunities for artists and public events like Handmade Holidays and The Big, our annual open exhibit. Art Center East serves approximately 25,000 people annually. And this year's Handmade Holidays in two days of socially distant shopping uh, brought in $17,000 in sales for local artists. So um, we're really excited about that accomplishment. And um, although the freeze is adversely affecting the organization's ability to earn income, um, we would really welcome folks who are um, able to, to donate tonight. Um, I have included in the chat a link to our um, donation website. So if you want to donate via PayPal for um, the opportunity to be here and hear Jennifer's poetry, feel free to do that. The link is also available um, permanently on the Art Center East website for folks who want to donate um, after the event. It's my pleasure to welcome Jennifer here tonight. Um, you may know that she's, she's the author of four books of poetry. Um, the Body is No Machine uh, was produced by New Issues and won the 2008 Devil's Kitchen Reading Award in Poetry. In the Human Zoo from University of Utah Press was winner of the Aga Shahid Ali Prize in 2010. No Confession, No Mass from the University of Nebraska Press won a number of awards, including the Prairie Schooner Book Prize, the Bisexual Book Award for Poetry, and the Publishing Triangle Audre Lorde Award. Her most recent collection of poetry is from Airly Press this year, um, called Again. And she recently won an Oregon Literary Fellowship. So we're really excited to have her here tonight. And I have, for those of you who would love to get a collection of her poetry, please take a look at the link in the chat to her book's website. So you can order there a signed copy of any of the four of her um, poetry collections. So Jennifer, I'm, I'm so glad to hear, have you here tonight and I'll look forward to hearing your writing. Thanks so much. I'm glad to be here and um, thank you all for being here as well. Um, I'm gonna start with reading some poems from my new book again and then I'll read a few poems that I've written more recently. Uh, most, all of the poems and again were written in 2017. They were written in the first at least the first drafts were written in the first 100 days following the inauguration in 2017. And each word or each poem in the book takes as its title a word that was misused or overused by the current US president. Um, and the poems are in some ways an attempt to, to reinfuse each of those words with different meanings. Um, and so I think of the book as being not about Trump um, but about who we are sort of collectively as Americans, who we have been, who we want to be. And so I'll start with the first two poems in the book. Uh, the first poem is Tremendous. We woke to find the creature hovering over us. We gnawed our lips, eyed its hooves, imagined trampling. We bowed down so it might see fit not to smash us. When we grasped, we might yet survive. Rough flowers blossomed on our fingers. We garlanded the great creature with homespun roses, wrapped its horns with petals. Our arms grew tired, but we kept our weary hands raised in praise. When we could worship no more, we fell back to the floor, hoping the creature would not tear our limbs from us. Silence was our final reverence. For years, we did not speak until our tongues and teeth forgot words. 
We were sure the beast could sense our faintest trembling. We waited for the brute to make its move. When we died, the creature kept roaring, never once touched our bones, never even knew we were gone. And then the second poem in the book is called Terrific, and it um, has a, a bit of a nod in it to uh, Rilke's Duino elegies in which he writes, every angel is terrifying. Terrific. When the angels came to our land, we could not fathom our good lot. We could not shield ourselves against their strangeness fast enough. When they washed ashore, there was no whirlwind, no cloud of amber fire. There were thousands of dread faces. There were no survivors. We did not touch them. We heard the breaking surf fussing over their wings. We could not ignore their message, could not send them home. Then I'll read uh, this poem it's called First. And this one borrows uh, pretty heavily from Dante's Inferno and the different circles of hell, hell the first of which is limbo. First. And now in this circle, the poets, philosophers, men of science and of state, those who wait in limbo, who chose virtue, yet have no hope of exiting the abyss. How exquisite the meadows of hell, green and gated, fed by a brook, we know this is the entrance to the steep decline, to the halos of lust and gluttony and greed, and deeper into violence, into the center of treachery. Forget those rings, their punishments. Let's remain among the guiltless damned, end our journey before we reach the place where no thing gleams, the spectacle of hoarders and spendthrifts pelting each other with their great weights. Let's put behind us the sullen waters and thorny trees, the plain of burning sand. We need no more reminders that such ditches exist. Ignore the torments, faint cries of panderers and hypocrites. Pay no mind to the renowned beast trapped in ice at the core of our world. Neglect the whir of its wing beats, its vain weeping. We have no time to descend to those spheres. We belong here, just this side of the river, among the most decent of sinners. I have been um, fascinated for a long time by, I have some friends of friends who are um, self-identified self preppers um, who have been stockpiling for a disaster for a long time and um, who this year have been maybe bloating a bit over that. Um, but I've also been really attentive how this year more and more of us are beginning to incorporate aspects of, of that sort of preparation lifestyle because we're living through so many disasters of um, you know, pandemic, economic crisis, climate crisis. Um, and so I've been thinking for many years about how we continue to live through disaster and prepare for it without also giving into sort of extreme fear. and. Um, I think that's sort of where this next poem came from. It's called Disaster. And my hope is that we don't end up in the sort of grim place that it depicts. Disaster. We survived underground. Gray water recycled, shelves piled high with medicine and food. Of course we had guns. Who knew we did air clear. 
the old ones said we were safe down here. They claimed they were our parents, that we'd never been beyond the bunker. They lied. We lived outside. How else would we know the give of earth underfoot, the gloss of sun on our skin? No matter. We took the guns. We sent out the elders one by one. None came back. We make children now in this dark room, whisper to them of the sea and sky. One day we'll send them out too. For now, we keep watch on the supplies, each other, the guns. We sip shallow breaths. We remain buried, alive. Um, let's see, read. I think I'll move to, so this, the first section of the book, it's all in that sort of we voice. And then in the second section, it moves to a first person singular. So it's in an I voice. Um, so I'll move to that section. And this, um, I think I'll read this poem honestly, which uh, I host a poetry radio show called The Occasion. And this month, the guest uh, was Danielle Cadena Doolin, who read a poem on the show that was called to philosophize is to learn how to die. And the poem, it's, it's really brilliant. And it uses the story of A Thousand and One Nights and Scheherazade to explore uh, gun violence and the value that we do or don't place on life. Um, and I've been thinking about the conversation that I had with her about um, and about the story of Scheherazade. And uh, even though if you're familiar with the story, um, I think it's easy to think of Scheherazade as sort of triumphing in the end that she ends this legacy of violence that had been happening in, um, in that place um, through her consummate storytelling skills. But in the end, um, I'm not really sure that it's a happy ending. She, she lives, but um, I don't know if, if her outcome is, is maybe what she might have hoped it would be. So this poem explores a bit of that. Honestly, it wasn't quite right to say I offered myself to the king. No sister waited in his chamber, begged for my tale. Alone, I came by my will to live the same way as all the others, only I knew lies. He meant to take me to bed or kill me, I couldn't recall. Either way, escape hinged on how I made fictions. A thousand times I prayed for dawn to break. It did not matter, I survived. In the end, he named me queen. His story held more sway than mine. One of the things that uh, I think starts to happen in the second section where there's uh, more of those I poems is that um, there's a little bit more tenderness sometimes, a little bit more possibility and desire um, than there are in some of the poems in the first section. And this, this poem is one of those, it's called Amazing and it draws on uh, the myth of the Minotaur um, who's kept at the center of the labyrinth and um, this is actually, I guess, similar to A Thousand and One Nights. It's a story where people sacrifice virgins to appease an angry beast. Um, and in this one, Theseus is the volunteer instead of Scheherazade who co comes in and says, I'm going to stop this. I'll kill the Minotaur. Um, and in the, the classical myth, Theseus is successful and has helped because uh, the king's daughter, Ariadne, helps him navigate the labyrinth by giving him a ball of thread that allows him to retrace his path back out. Um, so this is, um, I think, considering that story from the point of view of the Minotaur. Amazing. In the myth I invent, you do not hand your sword to the man who will kill me. You unspool your thread, mark the route. We both know the promise of a sure way out. From the center, 
The path back is a crease pressed to your face by sleep. I stop waiting for you to retrace your steps, quit plans to escape. You let the wind scuttle your string. Each night I learn I can devour and not be damned. And then I think I'll read um, this poem. It's called Nobody and it riffs on Emily Dickinson, um, which I think I know the whole poem. It's a very short poem. It's, I'm nobody, who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us. Don't tell, they'll advertise, you know. How dreary to be somebody, how public like a frog, to tell one's name the live long June to an admiring bog. Um, so I love Emily Dickinson. I love that poem. And um, I took the first few lines of it and ended it in a really different way. Nobody. I'm nobody. Who are you to tell me I'm not? To craft for me a name that fits slack as the bag in which I must carry the clothes you chose to cover or expose my nakedness. Who are you to assume I wear flesh, inhabit space, can be kept in this house of food and breath? Who are you to say you can observe me plain as day, sitting on your porch, sleeping in your bed, standing in your kitchen, cooling my head under the sink's tap. We are not a pair. I do not make a sound. Do not disturb the air with movement or voice. I do not fill my hollows with song. Do not stretch stiff limbs at dawn. Do not make charms to ward off the void. You think you're the true nobody. You could be. The trick's not to disappear. The trick is to learn you've never been here. So I think I'll move on from reading poems from this book and read some that I've been writing this year. Um, so these all, um, even though the book came out very recently, just two months ago, the poems are all from you know, to three, three and a half years ago. And these poems uh, have, that I'll be reading next are all, I, I think they've all been written since, um, since March of this year. So since the pandemic really um, has been more salient in our lives, I guess. And uh, this first poem is, um, it's about my mother. Uh, my mother and I were estranged for, um, pretty much the entirety of my adult life. And she passed away just over a year ago. And I'm, I think just now getting enough distance from her death that I've begun to write about it. And one of the um, surprises, I guess, in writing about her passing is that I've also started to find a certain kind of freedom to write about um, a particularly traumatic experience that involved my mother uh, when I was a child that I was never able to really write about when she was alive, so. This is one of those first poems that begins to explore that. It's called Portrait of My Mother as a Wanted Poster. For years when asked, I could not describe her face, her distinguishing features. At best, I'd trace a crude composite forged from Polaroids shot three decades past preserve her as a missing child might be, trapped in the last century. If someone out there searched for her, they would collect no bounty because of me. Then the image my older sister sent, our mother nodding off, slack-jawed on what would become her deathbed. The message, come now. I did, 
found her senseless in a rent by the month hotel. She'd grown so thin, her skin taut over her cheeks. She had lost her teeth. Her black mane had faded to wisps. Once every stranger remarked on our resemblance. That was before my mother took me with her on the run, before she made me disguises to hide from the police, sunglasses to shroud my Chinese eyes, a crimped perm that never quite took, spandex outfits meant to make me look grown. On the day I arrived at her last bedside, in that single room she called home. The nurse dressed me in a paper gown and gloves, protection against a fatal infection. I held her limp hands, stroked her silent face, the barrier intact between us. I would not take the risk, would not give in to the ache to place my cheek to hers, to rock her in my arms, welcome her into my embrace. Alone with her at last, I spoke, even if she could not hear. I longed to offer evidence, to make clear that I'd emerged unscathed, but my testimony kept stuttering back to how she'd asked me to pack my life into a single suitcase, those long hours in the car, her eyes searching the rear view for any sign of a chase, how we stayed in motion, hurtling from state to state to evade capture. I hadn't intended to dredge up such ancient muck, but some days I still feel stuck in that child's body pinned under an assumed name I was forced to offer to every kid I met, every potential friend I could have made along the way. Once I let my real name slip, tried to cover it up quick, feared for weeks that we'd be caught. Even now I hesitate when I meet someone new, pause to remember who I am, which me to introduce. Even in the hush before she drew her final breath, I could not utter her exact offense, not the crime confessed to me long ago, her trust I'd keep it secret, but this taste for escape she buried in me. I cannot say whether her actions were just, what I know, we were poor, and then we were not. There will be no trial. I will never hear her plead her case. Sometimes, even now, I'm riding in that back seat, face of a stranger reflected in the dim glass, rehearsing necessary lies. My mother is still driving all night, far from home, one hand tapping ash out the window, leaving behind us a trail of bright sparks, the other reaching for the satchel stashed in the passenger seat, the radio dial, my hand in the dark. I have been um, writing for a couple months now, a series of poems that are in the beautiful outlaw form, which is um, a form that I just learned about this year. And in each stanza, there's one letter that is excluded. So you can't use it at all. And you must use all of the other letters in the alphabet in that stanza. Um, so for instance, the first poem that I wrote this way was called Sickness. And so in the first stanza, you couldn't use the letter S but had to use all the other letters. And in the second stanza, you couldn't use I and then C and then K and so on. Um, 
And one of the things that I've found in writing these is that uh, it's really hard to include the letter X. So I decided to write a poem in which um, that letter is, is prominent because it's in the title. And uh, this poem also includes a reference to Goldilocks and the Three Bears, which I realized in writing the poem is either a story about home invasion or a story about hospitality, depending on how you look at it. The poem's called Xenophobia. I am quick to enter when you're gone, freeze at your alarm. I gave up on knocking long ago. I've bleached my black locks golden, tested each bowl and bed, never once said, this is just right. In shadow, I slip limbs into your faux furs, hold gauzy outfits to my skin. I was always your first quarry. I don't wish to fall victim to your wary claws, only want your jackpot. Oak chair built to your request, your exact size, custom made for rest. I crave your sleep tossed sheets, your full pot left to simmer. Ages past, my mother waited jittery at your step. Uninvited, she acquired fragile papers, skirted security checks. Named alien, she mixed with the inhabitants. She birthed me, made me citizen, misjudged this land as mine. This land is your last ditch in, visitors welcome or rejected at your whim. I am still a stranger here, asked to go back to a galaxy you imagine for me. I have tried to thread your needle, to squeeze into every guise you prescribe. To earn a dance at your masquerade, I've learned to turn away, to bar more guests, leave no door ajar. I'm now expert at keeping keys, erecting a maze of fences that lacks an exit. I've rehearsed this trap. Start with a fairy tale's dazzle and let it vanish. Begin with mystique, abundant prairies, huddled masses, and end with a majestic sea of shining caskets. Tonight, I'll tell another story. If I can't throw open the latches, snatch the hinges from the walls, I'll hijack your luxury Quaff your milk and honey, seize your velvet excess, dole that opulence out for everyone to touch. We may not ever raise the house, but we'll carve your bread to quench our hunger. We'll spread your jam over our tongues to take the edge off lifetimes we've lived like ghosts. We'll buzz with the exquisite jolt of setting foot where you'd forbid us. We'll come to be the hosts, step into your shoes, see how they fit us. And I think I will read just maybe two more poems. Um, so that, that form, the beautiful outlaw form, I learned about it through Broadsided Press. Um, which is an amazing press that pairs writing with art. Um, and earlier this year, they shared a set of very elaborate writing prompts and the beautiful outlaw was one of them. Um, but they also shared one that led to this next poem uh, that I'll read. And it, I, I don't even know that I can remember all of the details, but it, you had to describe something in your, in your home. You had to include a piece of etymology that you're obsessed with. Um, you had to include something that's impossible to have in your home. Um, and you also, the, the key one for me was that you had to include a phrase from a book in your home that you love and that you just open at random. And what you see is, is what you get and you have to use it in your poem. So I, I opened Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass and uh, came upon the, 
the stanza that read, um, to think how much pleasure there is. Have you pleasure from looking at the sky? Have you pleasure from poems? Um, and it was a very um, great instigator sort of early in the pandemic when um, I needed maybe Walt Whitman's words in my life. Um, and so I used his, his phrase, pleasure from looking at the sky in this poem. Things are looking up, says the evening news anchor. And so I do look up at the robin's egg blue of the ceiling. I gaze at the constellation of recessed lights that flicker when the heater cycles on and off, follow each crease of the hawk and trowel plaster. What previous owner smoothed and sharpened this expanse? Who chose this color to hover above the green grass cabinets? Were you the same one who set the hilt of a fern in the sunniest spot on this plot to brown despite my best attempts? Even now it unfurls new fronds that tap at the glass where I press my palm flat to match all those hands mapped in ochre on the walls of caves in Argentina, Indonesia, Spain, before land had those names. Still, we live tucked away, gods of small underworlds, chambers made by labor to conceal us as we build lives in our kitchens, on our couches, awake in our beds, passing time like Persephone, mining in the dark, her secret treasure, the spark of recalling her pleasure from looking at the sky. And then this last poem uh, is also inspired by uh, something that Broadsided Press did uh, before they created all these elaborate prompts. One of the things that they've been doing for a long time is posting uh, works of art and asking writers to respond to them with ekphrastic poems or ekphrastic prose. Uh, and so uh, very early on this spring, they had posted uh, an image. It was a sculpture by uh, Janice Redman of, uh, and the sculpture was called Ouroboros. And it looked sort of like a, a change purse with its clasp open, uh, except instead of just the sort of little curve at the bottom of the purse, it created a circle so that you could imagine things sort of moving through its body. Um, it was very cool and very strange. And uh, they did not choose my poem to pair with that, uh, that image, but I still got a poem out of it. Uh, so this is care and feeding. Um, and I should say that uh, part of the inspiration for me was looking at the image, that little purse opening reminded me of a little baby bird um, waiting for to be fed. Care and feeding. The leech clung to your thigh as you rose from the lake. I plucked it away, placed a kiss upon the wound so I could taste what it had tasted. I wanted the rusted metal of your blood on my tongue. We did not fear disease or not enough. We met in parking lots, got naked in beds of pickup trucks in parks by the river's edge. We did not know how to be birds after so much human handling. We were nearly featherless. If we fell from some nest, we fashioned new ones from undone strings, from loosed buttons. Unfinished in our summer skins, dusted in gold pollen, I clasped my lips to hip bone, to nipple. I have this tenderness I've kept in my pocket, worn smooth as a coin beneath my thumb's mindless caress. On sunny days, I bring it out to glint at the robins singing, cheer up from their trees. Your broad back under thin cloth, the ease of your bare chest amid a sea of wild bee balm, my fickle and liquid flit, salt kick, 
soft down of your coverts under my palms. The fold and spread of wings in each field we could find. Your mouth open, upturned, waiting to feed on mine. Thank you all for listening and I'm looking forward to hearing your work in the open mic. Thank you. Folks, feel free if you want to unmute and clap or um, we'll have also some time to ask Jennifer questions. So your job as a good listener is to come up with some good questions. Thank you. Yeah. So we can take questions uh, via audio or if you want to put them in the chat, feel free. I have a question. Great. I have I have lots of questions about the the poem about your mom, but uh, you can't. I don't think you can tell. You can answer those. Um, um, but no, I have a question about. You said you said uh, towards the beginning that uh, in one section of the book had a lot of we poems, and the other section had a lot of I poems. And I'm curious, uh, was that a determining factor on where the poems went in the sections, or is that something that you noticed? after you had put the poems in the sections. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I totally see what you're saying. Um, it was something that as I wrote, um, as I was writing the poems, I started to notice this we voice emerging, which uh, was sort of weird for me. I'd never ri really written that way before. And so as I was putting the book together, it was a more deliberate choice of, I started to realize, oh, all of these poems that are in that plural voice should probably go together and then there will be a separate section that's in a more a more personal more singular voice that people might more readily identify as my voice than or someone like me than as this sort of grand collective strange speaking voice was that the main way that you chose to um to to put the poems into sections or were there other other uh themes or something like that yeah, that was the main way. There's there are three sections in the book. So the first the first section is e pluribus, uh, the second section is unum, and then the third section is et al. Or um, and so that first section is the the we voice, the second is the I voice, and the sort of and others that comes at the end. It's like a coda, and the four poems that are in there are uh, their titles are Make America Great and Again, and so it was. Um, it felt like those needed their own separate section. They didn't quite belong with the other ones. Gotcha. Thanks. Great, are there other questions? I was interested in, I mean, I loved all the poems, but the one about the Minotaur, that the figure of Ariadne is so fascinating. And have you ever thought about exploring her story or writing a companion, talking about her role in that particular myth. Yeah, originally when I, um, when I first started writing that poem, I was trying to write it from her perspective um, and I kept shifting back to the Minotaur, um, but I feel like the, there is, there are probably many good poems to be written from her perspective because uh, without her, the rest of the story kind of doesn't happen. And, and she's, I believe she also sort of in the aftermath of it, she's sort of left behind by Theseus, mm -hmm. um, which also could be a sort of compelling thing to dig into. Yeah, when you look at the role of women as either obstacles or helpers in a lot of those stories, it seems to me there's a whole world that we don't really get. We study the heroes, we study sometimes the monsters, but a lot of time, and I guess it's, you know, that's not surprising given the whole history of patriarchy and Western civilization at least, but I just feel like that's a really huge untapped um, possibility. I'm not trying to suggest what you should write, but I just, they just sort of raise that, that kind of question. Yeah. Yeah. I love persona poems that are in, that take on those perspectives that have been sort of made secondary or peripheral in the original tellings, um, you know, and they're not, they're not poems, but I think of like Madeline M Miller's uh, Circe and Margaret Atwood wrote um, the Penelope ad where like taking these 
the myth of Odysseus and just retelling it completely from Penelope's or Circe's perspective. And um, I, yeah, deeply admire writers who um, can just reimagine that entire world from, from that shift so that it is centering, um, centering a different voice in the conversation. Yeah, so many women's voices get left out of those kinds of stories. Um, and yet the stories themselves wouldn't be possible without the participation. I just finished writing a review of a really excellent book about um, Helen of Troy uh, by a young woman poet. It's called Helen or My Hunger. And she's exploring that. And it draws from HD's poem called Helen in Egypt, which I had heard of but never read before. And to, to look at that, you know, there's a, it's a whole alternate story of the Trojan or at least of Helen's role. So it's just, yeah. it's on my mind. Thank you. Hey, Jennifer, uh, you read The Sickness. You didn't read it tonight. Uh, it's another beautiful outlook form. And I got fascinated by it. In, and it's, it's really fun to read. Uh, it's not only, you know, some poems are wonderful just to listen to, but there, there is something about this form that kind of is very appealing also when you read it because you see the, the amount of labor that goes into it to, to be able to make it work. So I put in the chat a link to Broadside Press and directly you can see Jennifer's poem, Sickness, and it has a description there on um, a lot of the, what's the name of the French group, Olipo? Yeah. Uh, Olipo. Yeah, the Olipo forms and the description of them. And I really thank you for introducing me to that form because I, I started to play with it and it's, it's a nice challenge. <laughs> it expands your vocabulary for sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. I feel like I owe Broadside and Press a huge debt of gratitude for introducing me to the forum because now um, I've, I've written quite a number of these and I, it probably will turn into my next book. And um, one of the things that I love when you say that it, they're they're pleasurable to read. I, I, I feel like they're pleasurable to read because you can see the, the labor involved, but also um, like reading them out loud. Um, there's, uh, because we, there are certain letters that we don't routinely include in our everyday language, which is sort of strange. And then to have to repeat those sounds um, and to visually see those letters reproduced over and over, um, as I don't know, there's something that is just uh, viscerally pleasurable about uh, getting to to say words that you don't normally say, but that are part of our everyday language. Like I try to go out of my way not to use a word that's super obscure, um, just to squeeze in a, a Z or a Q or something. Um, but yeah, they're um, that I found them to be. Uh, a great solace this year because they're so intense that I can't, I can't pay attention to some of the other things that are happening. Instead, I have to just really focus on what I'm doing. So it's been great in that respect too. Are there other questions? Well. I have a question. I'm not sure. It's like I feel like my question is still forming in my brain. Um, so I'll try to I'll try to say it out loud. And I don't know where it will take me. But um, I I thought I was just so struck by the poem about your mother. Thank you so much for reading that. Um, and uh, was that written during COVID? That was a really recent poem. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote that poem. Uh, in the last few weeks, actually, you, you all are the first to yeah. hear that poem. So thank you for being um, a kind, kind audience as I ex explored something that that felt very tricky for me. Well, I just I felt um, I, I'm not sure how to express this, but I feel like co this COVID landscape is so constrained. And it was so fascinating to me to have almost like this this, I want to say this road trip, but not like not a road trip, conventional road trip, but this road trip 
of this parent taking this child across these state lines again and again and again. Um, and I, I wonder if I wonder if there's any like connection to the um, like the constrained space that we're living in now and that interesting vision of that journey. I hadn't thought about that, but I I love that. Um, that I think part of what I what I was intentionally working toward in it was um, thinking about um, when when my mother passed, uh, she had an infection that did not allow me to touch her um, because it was um, it could be fatal and it was quite contagious and um, and I hadn't seen her in many years. And so I was I had entered into writing the poem thinking about all of the people who this year have lost loved ones under very similar circumstances and wanting to explore that. Um, but this other thing from my childhood just kept like poking through and um, it's something that I've tried to write about before and it's never really, uh, I've never been able to formulate it, but I love that possibility that because I've been in my house for so long and I wish I could drive cross country. I wish, um, I think there, the, there's a line in the poem about uh, um, the, the desire for escape that she buried in me and that feels uh, it's, it's always felt true that um, even though it was a really scary time, it was also um, a time of, of escape where I got to experience all of these things that I could never do while we were static. And, um, and I think this year I long for that a little bit, even if, even if it's, uh, I don't know, even if it's risky or dangerous. And of course I don't do it because the safe thing is to stay home and um, make sure other people are safe and but the longing is still there. <laughs> That's just really profound. Thank you so much. So maybe we could take one more question. Is there someone who has something that they'd love to ask? Susan? I don't have a question, but I have a comment regarding the poem about your mom it brought back something for me well a lot of things for me actually and so i could relate to it so much not the um necessarily the recent co you know covid type um death but and i'm so sorry but um something for my own traumatic past and my daughter and and years ago, think, when this happened, thinking, and it was, it seemed like a very similar circumstance, but it was different from what you went through. And, um, and going through it with my daughter and thinking, this is gonna be so bizarre when I think about it years from now. But I'd managed to suppress it. <laughs> <pretty much. laughs> but it was really interesting to think about it. And I, I just want to thank you for your writing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think there are things that, um, I don't know that it's healthy, but in, maybe in some ways it is that we kind of have to, to bury for a while and let them just um, stay there. And um, I hope that in whatever way it came up for you just now and resurfaced that it felt like a, a good resurfacing. and. Um, yeah, thank you. Well, at least I didn't, I don't feel so alone with this bizarre memory that I have. <laughs> it's like someone else experienced something similar, you know, it's very strange, but thank you. That's good. That's, that's, uh, thank you for saying that. I feel that's the, the main reason why I keep, uh, maybe not the reason why I write, but the reason why I try to share writing is hoping that someone out there will feel like, oh yeah, something in some way here it makes me feel less alone. So that connection, it's great. Thanks. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, thanks, Jennifer, for being with us tonight. Let's again give a round of applause. Yay. Yay. I'm so glad to have you here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'll just remind folks again the um, uh, there's a link in the chat to Jennifer's. Um, personal website with a list of all the books. Um, they're available for purchase. 
Um, there's also a link to the Art Center East donate page, um, which employs PayPal. So if you have an opportunity to support the Art Center, we very much welcome that donation at this time. So I'm going to I'm going to turn off the video now and we'll move into the open mic. So just hold on one second. <laughs> 